Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Hewitt from the Office of Communications, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center. We've gathered here today to make an announcement uh, on the future of commercial resupply launches to the International Space Station. As you can see, I am joined today by Ellen Ochoa, the director here at NASA's Johnson Space Center, Sam Shamimi, the director of the International Space Station Division at NASA headquarters, Kirk Shireman, the International Space Station Program Manager, and Julie Robinson, the Chief Scientist for the International Space Station Program. Now, each participant is going to make opening remarks, and then we will open it up for your questions, first here in the room, and then for those on the phone. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ochoa to kick it off. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, that includes everybody in the room, as well as those of you watching on NASA TV and listening to us on the phone. Thank you for joining us today for an important announcement. NASA is committed to advancing human spaceflight, and our team here at Johnson is at the heart of that mission. To achieve the seemingly impossible, we must be lean, agile, and adaptive to change. This philosophy is applied to every aspect facet of human spaceflight that we touch today, from the International Space Station and Orion to the various technology development programs that are laying the groundwork for our journey to Mars. Today's announcement focuses on the International Space Station, which for more than 15 years has served as a laboratory to advance scientific knowledge that will enable future exploration and benefit the lives of people on Earth. A lot of work is done by many talented people, both inside and outside of NASA, to make sure we get the most out of this one-of-a-kind facility. The space station remains a blueprint for global cooperation, with partner space agencies around the world working toward common goals of space exploration. And a new commercial space market is continuing to take shape, a robust destination for commercial scientific research, technology development, and human and cargo transportation. With that, today we are announcing the next chapter in the pub public-private partnership with American companies to ensure that NASA maintains the capability to resupply the space station from the United States through 2024. All right, thank you, Ellen. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sam Shamimi. Again, he is the uh, Director of the International Space Station Division, all the way from NASA headquarters, joining us here today in Houston. Thanks, Sam. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Ellen and Dan. Uh, first of all, it's good to be here in Houston uh, today to announce the awardees for CRS-2. Seven years ago, when NASA announced the first ISS cargo resupply contracts with Orbital and SpaceX, we introduced a new way of doing business that takes advantage of the strengths of the American aerospace industry and the fixed price commercial services contracting. To date, our CRS-1 commercial providers have delivered over 35,000 pounds of research, crew, and maintenance hardware to the space station. Though it has not been easy by any measure, both our CRS-1 providers have experienced launch fa failures and are in the process of recovery. NASA and our industry partners have learned valuable lessons from these failures and the recovery to flight. As we look forward to continuing commercial cargo missions to the space station, we are also working with our commercial crew industry partners to deliver American and international crew members to the space station from the United States. By taking advantage of the U.S. industry strengths and leveraging commercial contract mechanisms, NASA is able to focus its resources on expanding human presence into deep space, including a journey to Mars, through cislunar space. Commercial cargo, along with commercial crew, are major elements in enabling the growth of a Leo, uh, low Earth orbit commercial market opportunities, both on the supply and the demand side. A little bit later, Julie will highlight the research that has been enabled by turning over access to low Earth orbit to private industry. The National Lab, via CASES, has been able to take advantage of the access to space station that commercial cargo providers have provided to really expand the private and non-government, uh, uh, non-NASA government use and research on board the space station. Now, I'd like to announce the CRS awardees, if that's all right with everyone, <laughs> in alphabetical order. First, Orbital ATK of Dulles, Virginia, Sierra Nevada of Sparks, Nevada, and 
SpaceX of Hawthorne, California. These contracts begin upon award, each contract guaranteeing a minimum of six missions. However, as of today, we have not yet ordered any of those missions. Through these multiple awards and the contract delivery flexibility and indefinite delivery and indefinite quantity nature of these fixed price commercial services contracts, NASA and CASIS will be able to take full advantage of this amazing international endeavor, the space station, to meet NASA and the nation's goal in exploration and the development of the commercial market in low Earth orbit. All right, thank you, Sam. Now we're going to go to the International Space Station Program Manager, Kirk Shireman, so he can share more details uh, and the service options for these contracts. Kirk? All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, it's great to be here this afternoon, uh, and it's really a, really a pleasure to, uh, to make these announcements and, and get on with the business of the International Space Station. Um, the Source Selection Committee uh, carefully evaluated all the proposals. Based on that evaluation, the selection official chose the proposals provide the best value to meet NASA's requirements. Uh, and those requirements allow us to resupply the space station through the year 2024. Uh, I want to emphasize the reason we're here is not just to talk about the contracts, but also to talk about what these contracts enable. Um, it's really important, it's very, very important that we continue on the, uh, the work that we're doing on ISS, and these contracts will enable us to do that. Science and research uh, in that unique laboratory that only we can uh, explore uh, about outside of the Earth's gravity. The, um, the, uh, uh, this also, the ISS will allow us to, uh, to uh, advance humans' presence deeper into space. All these things really are enabled by these contracts. Um, we use the knowledge gained from our CRS-1 or Commercial Resupply-1 contract and applied that knowledge to our requirements for CRS-2. Uh, when we awarded CRS-1, uh, we were learning how to operate the ISS without a space shuttle. Of course, we'd been flying the ISS for a while with the space shuttle, uh, and it, it took us uh, um, uh, a while to learn the new contracts and, uh, and how to write them appropriately. What we learned was a lot of times we actually volume out, was what we say. It, we actually will fill up the volume of these commercial resupply one vehicles, but not really use all the mass capability. And so we've added a requirement in uh, CRS-2 so that we will uh, we'll measure both the volume and the mass and use, that, uh, use these vehicles more efficiently. CRS-2 vehicles allow the delivery of larger amount of cargo at a single, in a single flight. Basically, it's reduce, uh, reduce the total number of missions. That's important for a couple of reasons. One is it's more efficient in terms of our crew time, and that's a precious resource aboard the ISS. Um, when the crew's unpacking and repacking uh, cargo, that's time that they're not spending doing research. Um, also, uh, it's important, uh, basically, because uh, comings and goings of vehicles is really uh, time intensive, just monitoring the approach and departure of the vehicles. With the CRS-1 ta uh, contract, we issued task orders when the contract was awarded that provided a dollar figure uh, for 20 metric tons of cargo. That was the original requirement in CRS-1. CRS-2 contract's a little different. We have more mission types, which allows us more flexibility, and it'll take us all some time to uh, determine the right mix of flights and missions to meet our needs. So again, we haven't issued any task orders yet, but we'll begin to work with the contractors, the awardees, to determine which missions best meet our mission needs in any given year. Another key difference about CRS-2 is an insurance requirement to cover damage to government property during launch services, reentry services, transportation to the vicinity of the ISS, and also actually docking and undocking from the ISS. We added additional constraints on milestone payments to ensure that sufficient progress is being made on station integration um, before we award those milestones. Um, CRS-2 will also require cargo processing pre- and post-flight. NASA provided a single set of requirements for resupply services, but offers, offers were allowed uh, uh, first, they were required to meet those requirements, but they were allowed uh, optional capabilities and mixing them in a manner they choose. Uh, basically, what happened is offers were allowed to, to mi bid different types of missions in order to meet these requirements. Each company's missions are unique, uh, and that's one of the great things about this contract. NASA can select any mix of missions from those companies' uh, offerings that best meet ISS missions or ISS requirements for a given year. The capabilities include 
uh, the capability requirements were 2.5 to 5 metric tons uh, of a pressurized up mass, pressurized down mass of 2.5 to 5 metric tons, uh, and that's down mass recoverable or also down mass disposal uh, or some combination of both of those things. Um, it also required an unpressurized up mass and disposal capability. As mentioned, in conjunction with the mass requirements, the vehicles need to have a minimum pressurized cargo density of 65 cargo transfer bag equivalents per 1,000 kilograms of pressurized cargo. The space station requires uh, approximately four resupply missions annually with the cargo distributed throughout the year. Resupply must be provided, uh, must be spread out for numerous reasons, including space available on the ISS, um, supplies, uh, launch dates, uh, meaning there's multiple vehicles, not only these cargo vehicles, but also crewed vehicles and, uh, and cargo vehicles from our other, other, other partners, uh, time commitment from the crew, uh, and like I said, uh, traffic to and from the, uh, the International Space Station, which have, uh, again, it's other vehicles, but it's also port utilization. We only have a few ports for, uh, for berthing and for docking. Uh, and finally, uh, and most importantly, to support our scientific needs aboard ISS. Packing in, packing supplies aboard the ISS is really a time-consuming process, and there's no one there but our astronauts, who are also our researchers, to accomplish these tasks. And that means that we're taking, anytime we're packing and unpacking a vehicle, we're taking away time from, uh, from the valuable research and utilization we do on ISS. Therefore, we wanted to be as efficient as we could with that process. So let's talk about some of the specifics of the uh, proposals. Orbital proposal, uh, Orbital ATK, uh, in their proposal, they offered three standard missions. Two missions provide pressurized cargo delivery and, disposable, and disposal, and one provides unpressurized cargo delivery and disposal. The pressurized cargo missions offer two variant, uh, variants one, uh, on different launch vehicles, one launching from Florida and one launching from Virginia. All missions from the orbital ATK proposal berthed to the International Space Station. Sierra Nevada uh, proposed two standard missions. Both of these missions provide pressurized cargo return and disposal, as well as unpressurized cargo delivery and disposal. These missions, uh, both types of missions launch from Florida. One, type mission, one of the missions has the ability to dock to the ISS, and the second has the ability to berth to the ISS. SpaceX proposal offered two standard missions. Both provide pressurized cargo delivery and return, as well as unpressurized cargo delivery and disposal. The missions both launch from Florida, one mission type docks to the ISS, and one mission type berths to the ISS. With all that in mind, it brings us to cost. The total cost paid under the contract will depend on which mission types are ordered. Uh, we, we're, when we're ordering these services based on our current estimate of the space station needs, um, and, it, and like I said previously, it really a, provides a flexibility to NASA and the International Space Station Program to order up the type of uh, the mix of pressurized, unpressurized, return, and disposal that we need at any given time. While we do not anticipate expand, uh, expending the total value of the contract, uh, the indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type of contract enables us to adjust uh, as necessary for additional missions or contingencies, um, and it provides the greatest benefit to, to NASA so that we can fully utilize this great asset that we have um, in space. Missions and prices vary depending upon how we order, how many we order, what type we order, and when we order. Uh, as an IDIQ contract, we have the flexibility we need in order to order the, the missions a la carte um, or a groupings, whichever we choose, which makes it impossible to give a specific cost at this date. Each mission is complex and requires several years of lead time. Um, the lead time was also in the proposals. Discussion and engineering assessments will start very soon leading to integration work to the ISS later this year, and we want to make sure that all the ISS requirements are met. Uh, we expect the first missions under CRS-2 to begin in late 2019. After we've had time to debrief all the companies that submitted a pros proposal, we'll be able to provide you with additional details, including making the source selection statement public. The ultimate goal of CRS-2 is to ensure that we maximize the use of the International Space Station as a national laboratory by providing supplies and services to the International Space Station. We want to dispose of unnecessary cargo and return back the necessary uh, research 
and, uh, and cargo that we need back to, I, uh, back to the ground um, through the years 2019 through 2024. This will ensure that, that we keep the I International Space Station fully stocked for crew, enable people like Julie, uh, our chief scientist, and her team, and private industry, other government agencies, and including our international partners uh, to fully utilize the, uh, the uh, ISS as a, as a laboratory. This uh, laboratory, the national laboratory portion, is run by CASIS, and they're a big part of, uh, of how we utilize ISS, and again, the flexibility we have with this procurement will allow us uh, to, uh, to make uh, CASIS and their use of the national lab successful. We look very much forward to working with Orbital ATK, Sierra Nevada, and SpaceX in the future. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you, Kirk. Now we're going to turn it over to Julie Robinson, who again is our chief scientist for the International Space Station program. Julie? Thanks so much, Dan. Every day, NASA and our partners conduct extensive scientific research on board the International Space Station. But that research needs to be delivered to the space station and in some cases returned to the scientists back here on Earth. We rely on commercial resupply service providers for that transportation. Our experience with CRS-1 has shown how important our access to the station is, not just for NASA, but for the wide array of companies now taking advantage of the station's role as a U.S. national laboratory. Working with our commercial resupply partners, as well as the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, CASIS, uh, managers of the National Lab, has led to new users from the commercial sector, academia, other government agencies, and even other countries taking advantage of the space station's facilities. The new requirements will ensure the companies chosen for CRS-2 will maintain the flexibility required to meet the demands of space station research, including the ability to continue to fly unpressurized payloads, things like the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM, going up later this year, and various Earth observation instruments, like the International Space Station Rapid Scat, uh, an instrument looking at winds, as well as maintaining the ability to return research samples and hardware back to Earth. The option to provide an accelerated pressurized return as part of any standard mission, which means that a sample return could be in three to six hours after landing instead of 24 hours, is a huge advance for a number of different research disciplines and one potential service about which we're really excited. CRS-2 resupply missions will also overlap with our commercial crew program, which will enable us to add a seventh astronaut to the space station, significantly increasing the amount of crew time we have to conduct research. The CRS-2 companies will deliver that important cargo, as well as the research and the supplies for the additional crew members. We, and that is the scientific community that's not limited to just space science, but extends to physical science, biological science, earth science, astrophysics, and more, we learn every day from the research conducted on the space station, and we use that knowledge in ways that benefit humanity. Some benefits are immediate and tangible right here on Earth, and some pay dividends in by enabling us to continue exploration, moving humanity deeper into space and inspiring us all. We all should be thrilled at what today's awards mean to ensuring all of this good work continues so that we can get the most out of the space station while maintaining the flexibility necessary as we continue to expand the community of scientists and researchers using our space laboratory. Okay, thank you, Julie, and thank you again to all of our briefers. Now we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, just a reminder for everybody on the phone, if you have a question, you need to press star one to get in the queue, and then you can press star two to withdraw your question once you are in there. Please keep in mind that as with any NASA procurement, the selection rationale and additional details will be released uh, at the appropriate time in the future. I ask that everybody sticks to one question for now, since we do have a high volume of people waiting to ask questions. And then if we have time at the end, we'll go around for follow-ups. As always, please start off with your name and affiliation. I'm going to start off in the room going left to right like I always do. Robert, he's obviously been here. <laughs> Uh, hi, Robert Perlman from CollectSpace.com. Um, it was mentioned the lessons learned from CRS-1. Um, can someone comment on how, if at all, the, uh, the recent launch failures played into the decision to pick three providers and to give you that option of, uh, of after experiencing two providers being grounded? 
Uh, so I'll, I guess I'll take that question. So the um, first of all, uh, the, uh, the the source selection is based on a number of factors. One of them is past performance, and so so for uh, and, and a failure of certainly factors into past performance. So in that sense, it was was considered in uh, in our selection uh, of of the offers for this particular procurement. But uh, you're right, one of the considerations from an operational standpoint from ISS, it's really important to have more than one supply chain. And having multiple, having multiple offers means at any given time you could have, uh, you, you know, the sequence of flights could be one, you know, Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, orbital ATK. And so you have the ability to, if, if you have, if you lose one, you have the ability for another one being right after it from a different, a, a dissimilar redundancy or a different supplier. So that's that's a big, uh, a big uh, help to us. Now all of these vehicles have different capabilities, so it's not really, it's not like buying a commodity off the shelf. There are differences and there are impacts associated with it. But it, that's certainly a consideration um, uh, that, that we uh, that we thought about even in, in developing the procurement and, and selecting. Uh, selecting the various uh, winners of this particular procurement. Eric? Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Uh, you know, in some ways, getting the second contract is harder than getting a first contract. You know, the fact that you're here seven years later, it kind of validates the commercial approach. You've done uh, cargo, you're doing crew. Just kind of wondering in a big picture, you know, as, as NASA looks to partner further with the commercial sector through the fixed price contract, you know, what you know, what's the next step? Is it, you know, habitat modules, uh, heavy lift? I mean, what, where do you sort of see commercial partnership sort of progressing? Uh, so I'll take a, I'll take a shot at that. Well, and then maybe Sam has a, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with ISS through through cases is foster a, foster a low earth orbit economy. And so uh, where we have the opportunity to achieve that goal through through commercial contracts like this that are uh, that are fixed price, that I think you'll see it continue. It's hard to sit here and enumerate exactly what the what what those are. But we want to make sure we we get the best value for uh, for the uh, for the government for the for the American people, and we also want to make sure that we're achieving our goal of fostering a a, a commercial um, uh, economy in low Earth orbit. So I, absolutely, you will see more as time goes on. What those specifics are, it'd be hard for me to to answer specifically. Same, uh, yeah, if you'd like to add. Yeah, to that, that, that's really good, Kirk. Well, what I would say is that uh, as we move forward, um, not only uh, what comes after space station, but as we move for, uh, human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit into cis lunar space, uh, we're looking at um, ways and, and means to uh, develop the, the commercial market and just U.S. industry in general to achieve our goals. So like uh, Kirk said, we haven't made any definitive decisions about uh, what's traditional development, what's uh, commercial development, but uh, we're looking at all those possibilities, and we're leveraging the station we have today, like Kirk said, to enable the, the commercial market, not only just on you know modules and spacecraft, but the way we do business um, uh, in low Earth orbit, uh, and also in developing the commercial demand, which is even is even more important than just the, the commercial supply as well. Gene. Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Julie, you talked about a seventh astronaut. What are the complications with that, and how do you get them there? And you know, you have to have three, you know, three lifeboats. Talk to me a little bit about that seventh astronaut and why it's important. So the, of course, the the technical reason we don't have seven astronauts today is that our each of our lifeboats holds three, and so uh, you can't have um, efficiently have lifeboat capacity for. Um, seven crew members. So once we have commercial crew, that will allow both transportation of four crew members up to the space station as well as return of four crew members in a lifeboat function. And so that's what lets us bring the space station to its actual original design, which was to have seven crew members. From a research perspective, it's enormous because then all we have to do is bring a few extra supplies for the crew. Uh, to sustain them while they're on orbit, and we get basically that whole additional crew member does nothing but research in um, all of their all of their time. So it makes a big difference for the amount of research that we can do on the ISS for our throughput, if you will, and um, and it makes an extraordinary difference for some of the really hot areas that we're seeing a lot of commercial companies, like pharmaceutical companies and um, other organizations that are interested in doing research on the space station. It really enables the kinds of research that they do, which sometimes are very intensive. 
Okay, we're going to go to the phone now. And again, if you are on the line and you have a question, you need to press star one to get into our queue. Let's start off with Alan Boyle of GeekWire. Alan? Uh, thank you for taking the question. I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, Sierra Nevada and the plans to use the Dream Chaser. I just wanted to make sure that one of the options does call for the uh, spacecraft to return to Earth. I think that's what Julie was referring to when, with the capability of getting something back in three or four hours. So uh, if that's the case, could you talk a little bit about the effect of having this new type of spacecraft, uh, a winged spacecraft, uh, in the in the fleet and what it means for science and what it means for the perception that people might have of the space effort. Thank you. So, uh, well, let me let me start off a little bit. So, yes, yeah, Sierra's proposal does have have a vehicle returning. Actually, it returns to Earth and lands uh, um, uh, both types of missions that they offer. The difference of the types of missions really has to do with its uh, interaction with the space station on orbit. Um, and so uh, it's, it, it lands, you can get cargo off very, very quickly, which, uh, and Julie can comment on that from a scientific standpoint. It also has a, a, a milder return profile, so, uh, which also might have benefits. Uh, so we have the ability of looking at that possible return versus the other types of return that we have. Um, so that's important. And finally, it's a different, it's a, a, again, a dissimilar redundancy. We talked a little bit about that. Um, we have the ability to, to dial up that capability if one of our other capabilities is unavailable to us. Just, just to add a little bit about what it means scientifically, right now we have biology studies that are going on on the space station and we bring home live organisms. When those organisms come home, if they have a really hard landing, a splashdown, then they're at sea for a couple of days, you've really disrupted that before the scientists can take their final set of measurements. So that rapid return uh, return plus three hours or return plus six hours is really valuable. And the soft landing is also valuable. Uh, it also matters for some physical sciences samples in things like protein crystal growth experiments where the hardness of the landing could actually uh, disrupt the samples. And so this is a really nice capability to add to the suite of things that we have available. Okay, let's go to Jason Rian with Spaceflight Now. Jason? Hey, this is Jason Ryan with Spaceflight Answer. Sorry, sorry, I'm having a hard time getting off my speaker phone. My quick question is, um, given that you already have two participants under CRS-1, um, what dynamics can we expect to change on station besides the addition of the seventh astronaut, and how much did the budget request play in uh, NASA's ability to add its third uh, partner? Thank you. Uh, so I would say the, the, the real issue with respect to, to having two are, are our lessons learned in CRS-1. Uh, the, the big issue was we want to make sure we have a, you know, have a, um, a robust suite of, of vehicles that go up to ISS. Um, we're also, one of the considerations, as I mentioned before, is also fostering a, a, a low Earth orbit uh, economy. Um, that's a, a, an important consideration for us. And so all those things kind of uh, kind of fit into uh, into why we uh, w why it makes sense to have uh, to have three providers. So we're looking very much forward to having uh, having all three companies uh, provide their capability. In terms of what happens at space, I think the it's not so much the um, the individual vehicles as it is the fact that we're carrying more cargo on each vehicle. Therefore, in aggregate, we're going to have fewer vehicles. Uh, over time coming to the ISS, and that helps because well, the crew has to, you know, believe it or not, dockings and undockings or berthings and unberthings are, are, are uh, critical. I would say, I'll, I'll call them dangerous. Well, they require uh, risky. They're, they require the attention of our crew members. So we have, to, we have to set up all the equipment necessary to support a docking or a berthing, and uh, we have to monitor it with our crew members, and the same is true with undocking and unberthing. And so having fewer of those allows us to, uh, to actually use more time for, for research. And finally, the different types of missions, some of them are docking and some of them are berthing. And the, the beautiful thing is we have, we'll have two docking ports and we'll have two berthing ports. And so the different types of emissions allow us to fully utilize all those ports. And it's flexible, the way this procurement is, it's flexible enough that we can, we can dial those in as, our, uh, as, our, as the mission sequence and our uh, requirements uh, dictate. All right, let's go to Gotham with Cowan and Company. Gotham, go with your question. 
Yes, thank you for taking my question, and congratulations. Hey, I was um, wondering if you could comment on how quickly you would anticipate issuing initial task orders given the lead times for the missions. And, and secondly, uh, will each mission be competed, each task order be co uh, competed among the three going forward? Uh, so our our plan is to begin working with the companies immediately. Certainly, we'll 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 start working with them and doing engineering assessments. Uh, it's certain to us exactly when we'll issue the task, the, the first task order uh, for ISS integration. But we anticipate that later on this uh, this year, uh, and we, we expect the first flight under CRS2 to be in uh, in late 2019. And, and that's okay. I mean, from an ISS perspective, uh, operationally, that's okay. We have flights under CRS-1 that will allow the ISS to, uh, to be productive all the way through, uh, through that time period. So the meshing of CRS-1 and CRS-2 looks like it's going to work out, work out really well. So, we'll, again, like I said, we'll, we'll begin working with these companies um, immediately under, on their CRS-2 flights, but, uh, but the task orders might follow later this year. Okay, next up we have Bill Harwood with CBS News. Bill? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Kurt, uh, and I just want to make sure I understand the scenarios fully, but you're saying all three of these contract winners can deliver cargo, pressurized cargo and unpressurized to the station, but they can also bring it safely back down to earth. None of these are designed to burn up, or am I missing that? And also, you said docking and berthing, so I'm assuming any, any vehicle that docks would go to the IDA zone, Harmony Zenith and, and forward and that any berthing mission goes to Unity Nader and, and Harmony Nader. Is that right? Thanks. As always, your, uh, your knowledge of the ISS impresses me, Bill. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, no, all the cargo vehicles, all of them can bring up pressurized cargo. All of, uh, all of, the, all of them, uh, and when I say all, uh, each company has the ability to bring up pressurized cargo. Each company has the ability to bring up unpressurized cargo. The only ones who, uh, and all three companies have the ability to uh, dispose of cargo, both pressurized and unpressurized. However, uh, Sierra Nevada has the ability to, to bring home cargo that's recoverable. So when, when we talk about the science samples um, that, that, uh, that Julie was mentioning earlier, that, that the only two options for that are Sierra Nevada and uh, SpaceX. So um, th those are the two, the two options that have recoverable pressurized down mass. None of the vehicles provide pressurized, I'm sorry, unpressurized down mass. So it, it, it's a little, I, I realize it's a little confusing and I apologize for that, but, but it's confusing to have this press conference, but it turns out to be really great flexibility for us to execute the International Space Station program. So, um, and that's one of the great things. We have some, we have the, we, these dials, if you will, and we can, we can, uh, we can, uh, by choosing the various companies and the various types of missions from each company, we have the ability to, to manage our risk and to get the right amount, the right balance of, dis of disposal of cargo versus recovery of cargo. Okay, next up we have Ken Kramer with Universe Today. Ken? Hi, thank you, and thank you for doing this. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about SNC. I'm, I'm wondering... Did you pick them specifically because they can they can land on the runway in a few hours, or is it more to have uh, the redundancy with the uh, with uh, with a third uh, cargo provider? And also, can you provide an update on the next uh, mission or two that you're planning to the ISS? Thanks. So uh, we actually picked them because they had a great proposal. So, but the details of the source selection will be made public here uh, in the near future. So I, I'd rather defer defer that, uh, that until the source selection is, uh, is made, uh, made public. Um, in terms of operations on the ISS, um, we are currently working with SpaceX on their, uh, their next mission to ISS. We call it SpaceX 8. Um, they call it Falcon 9-23. Um, and uh, we'll, we, we typically let those, uh, those companies <laughs> announce the, the launch date, but I can tell you we're in constant communication. Uh, as was mentioned, they're, they're, uh, they're first of all, recovering from, uh, from a mishap, uh, number one. And number two is the, the, the Falcon 9, uh, the type of Falcon 9 that we're flying is also a new, a new vehicle, um, a, a new higher thrust in, engine and, uh, and stage. And so uh, not only are they recovering from the incident, but they're, they're working through a, basically a, 
an, uh, mod modified vehicle. So they've flown that once. They flew it in December very successfully. And as you probably noticed, they, they landed uh, the first stage back on, on, uh, on the ground in Florida. Um, they're looking at the data. Um, we're actually the third flight of this full thrust rocket. So Falcon uh, 9-23 or SpaceX 8 is the third flight of, of this new type of rocket. And so uh, we'll let SpaceX identify the, the launch date, but we're working with them and, and it certainly meets our requirements. Orbital ATK uh, is going to fly, we, and, and we call it OA-6, so it's Orbital ATK-6 will launch from, fly, uh, from uh, Florida. Right now the launch date from that is uh, March 10th, and, uh, and that appears to be, uh, to be on track. Um, uh, the the, the um, Orbital 5, which I apologize for the way we number things, but uh, is the subsequent orbital flight, and it'll be out in the summer time frame. We don't, uh, we don't have a definitive date on that. And that flight will be from, on an Antares uh, 230 rocket from, from Wallops Island. So I can tell you right now, things are going really well on orbit. We're preparing for a spacewalk tomorrow, and we're prepared to have, uh, have SpaceX 8 and orbital uh, ATK-6 arrive to the space, space station here in the near future. All right, next up we have Irene Klotz with Reuters. Irene? Hi, thanks very much. Um, I have a couple questions for Kurt. Um, do these uh, CRS2, CRS2 contracts have a, um, the IDIQ, have a maximum value similar to the $3.1 billion that the CRS1 contracts had? Uh, so the, uh, the contracts have, in aggregate, the, the, when the, the procurement, the RFP that we sent out, had a maximum value of $14 billion. I can tell you that the mix of flights that we're looking at is, is nowhere near that value. We don't expect to get anywhere close to that value. Um, but from a, from a uh, federal acquisition requirements, we have to put a maximum contract value, and that's what was put in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the, the request for proposals. Um, there is a minimum number of missions to ISS in each of these contracts. So there is a minimum of six missions uh, from each of these providers. So, uh, and, and I, you know, again, I talked about it in my opening statement. There's no way to give you a good exact cost of what, uh, of what we expect. But like I said, it, it won't be anywhere close to the maximum contract value. Okay, next we have Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Frank? Thank you. Uh, Kurt, just to continue on Irene's question, uh, what's the um, nominal performance time for that big number uh, contract? How long will you be doing the, the CRS2 missions, at least from the beginning? And also for Julie, um, is there any science that you can't do now that will be enabled by this uh, Sierra Nevada uh, capability of soft landings and quick uh, unloading? So let me do mine, and I'll pass the buck to uh, to uh, Julie for her question. But uh, the the intent right now, the the, uh, the law of the land, and our uh, authorization, NASA's authorization bill, is that ISS is up through 2024. All the international partners, uh, with the exception of ESA, have uh, also agreed to go to 2024. We uh, ESA is having their ministerial meeting, which is where they would would take such action uh, in December of this year, and, uh, and we, uh, we are looking forward to positive results from, from ESA. So uh, I, as I said earlier, we expect the first flight to be in the latter half of 2019. ISS is authorized in, uh, in the United States through 2024, and that would be, that would be the period. The, the, again, one of the benefits of this procurement is there, the, there's going to be enough room between what, it, what we actually expect to pay now and, and the, the maximum contract value that should ISS be extended or should we need a significantly larger number of flights than we think right now, we'll, we'll have plenty of room to do that without having to, uh, to adjust the contract value or, or, or uh, go out. Uh, it won't force us to do another procurement. We'll certainly have the option to do another procurement at that time frame. Um, none of those things are definitive at night. I'm, at this point, I'm just telling you what, what our options are uh, relative to uh, to what we would happen out beyond uh, 2024 and beyond. And uh, to give you some examples of the kinds of science that we can't do today that we will be able to do, 
uh, there are a whole bunch of different aspects of this new contract that are really appealing for science. But the big one that stands out to everyone is the R plus three or R plus six return, that return within three to six hours uh, of the samples to the scientists and within three to six hours of landing. And some examples of some things we can't do today, uh, definitely all the, the things that we're doing with living organisms, um, some things don't matter as much as others. So we have a, a live rodent return coming up um, on a future mission where it doesn't matter because we're looking at bone and bone doesn't change that fast. But of course, there are a lot of reasons to uh, use animal studies to look at things like balance or sensory motor effects, and those are gonna change so rapidly on return that we need to have the animals back right away. Also, cell biology, uh, microbiology, plant studies, all of those um, organisms start adapting immediately on return to gravity. And so to be able to look at the genetics of what actual genes are being expressed in a plant when it's not in a gravitational field, to get those kinds of measures, you really need the samples quite rapidly. Another area that's important is, is there have been a number of studies where we looked at microbial virulence, and that virulence uh, was maintained even when the microbes returned to Earth for a period of time. Some of that work was done on shuttle where we got the samples back within three to six hours. And so we haven't been able to reproduce all of those studies or extend them uh, until we have this rapid return capability. So those are just some examples of some of the really high profile work. Okay, next up we have Jeremy Cox with the Daily Times, and I'd just like to remind our phone bridge, please, just one question each for now so we can make sure everybody gets a chance. Jeremy? Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you could help me understand a little bit better how the orbital contract will work between uh, using the facilities in Virginia and Florida. Will those just be chosen, um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, or, or what ha what's happening there? So the, the contract, uh, the proposal by Orbital allowed, uh, allowed a mission type, three different types of missions, but uh, the, for pressurized cargo, they allowed a mission, a mission type that would launch from uh, Florida on an Atlas rocket or from uh, Virginia, uh, Wallops, uh, Virginia, on an Antares rocket. And, and it really it's up to, up to NASA uh, to decide which of those vehicles. Now, the vehicles have different capabilities, and so, uh, again, it's about what are, what are our needs they have different capabilities and different costs, and so we have the ability, uh, as time goes on, to evaluate uh, what we need and make that selection. You have to make that selection years in advance, according to the template. It takes a while to, to build and test a rocket before you're ready to fly it. So what we expect to do is evaluate that. Like I said, we're, we're starting our assessments here in the very near term with these companies, and we'll look at what our requirements are out in those years and make a decision. But it may not be the same rocket and the same location every time. We might very well decide to, to to buy uh, a few flights from Wallops and a, and a flight from, uh, from Florida. We'll just have to see as, as, uh, as our uh, work and assessments with these uh, providers continues. Okay, next we have Dana Hull with Bloomberg News. Dana? Yes, hi, thanks so much for taking the call. Is it, so since each company gets a minimum of six missions, is it fair to describe this as a straight three-way split or the monetary amounts could could differ wildly, and I guess you know part of the monetary equation is what the costs that each company bid. So I just want to make sure that I'm characterizing this correctly. Yeah, the contract has a minimum of six missions per per you know per, per selectee. So uh, so in that sense, it is it, it, the the everyone is going to get the minimum. Uh, it is likely that we will buy more than 18 flights. So we have three three winners. And if we need more than 18 flights, then we'll talk about what happens on those, those flights. So, um, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, whether or not uh, it's a split. Also, the, the cost from each of the providers or the, the price offered by each of the providers was different. And so, um, you know, other, the capabilities are different. It's really hard to go match up exactly, uh, you know, which one, which one, you know, is it, a, is it a, 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 an absolute 33%, 33% split? But uh, from a straight minimum buy, you could say that, yes. Okay, next we have James Dean with Florida Today. James? Hi, thank you. Um, because the, the Dream Chaser has not flown yet, is it subject to any test flight requirements before it begins its contract emissions? And I also wondered if there might be any changes to the uh, incumbent vehicles that would be noticeable. Um, you know, for example, something like dragons landing on land instead of water or anything like that. Thank you. 
So the, the, all the vehicles are required to meet are required to meet our requirements, and they're commercial vehicles, right? They're required to, to have a FAA license. And so um, do, do I expect Sierra to have test flights? Absolutely. But it's, again, it's, we have, we're buying a service. Here are our requirements. Uh, they have to get an FAA license. There are their requirements. And so uh, that's really how it's, how it's dictated. Uh, the biggest difference you'll see um, is, uh, is as I mentioned before, some of these are berthing missions and some of these are docking missions. Uh, docking missions are really cool in the sense they'll, they'll fly up and, and uh, uh, you know, there's, the, the crew doesn't have to operate an arm or anything like that to, to make them successful. Um, it's, uh, you know, an automation uh, uh, a, uh, task that has to happen and that'll be really, uh, really cool. The, um, the berthing missions, um, require ISS crew member intervention. They'll have to operate the arm. Um, and so you might ask, well, why in the world would you ever select a berthing mission? It turns out the hatches are different sizes. And uh, some of the cargo we have is really big. And uh, so berthing hatches are, are very, very large, and we have the ability to move racks in and out through a, uh, through a, hat, through a, uh, a berthing hatch. Um, Docking hatches are really uh, about the size of a, of a human, so uh, so it's, it's it's really again what do we need in terms of a mix at any given time for on orbit ISS? As far as the details of the proposal that the uh, of the uh, of that about water landing, land landing, and and so on, um, there are there are some that provide that talk about a land landing, and I, I don't know how much detail we're allowed to talk about about their proposals at this time, so. Let me, let me defer the answer to your question here a little bit, and, and uh, we certainly uh, will provide it shortly. Okay, next up we have Stephen Clark, Spaceflight Now. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if uh, maybe Kirk uh, could refresh my memory on how many flights have been awarded to uh, SpaceX and Orbital ATK under the CRS-1 contract. Is it still... Uh, 15 and 10 respectively, and do you expect to issue any more task orders under CRS-1 you know, uh, in the coming months to bridge any gap that may, uh, may be between CRS-1 and the first uh, CRS-2 mission? Thanks. Let's see. Um, uh, so the answer to the second question is yes, we, uh, we here in, uh, in December um, signed a task order with SpaceX for uh, for a flight to, uh, to to bridge the gap, if you will, between CRS-1 and CRS-2, and we have a proposal on, in our hands right now from uh, from Orbital uh, under CRS-1 uh, for for uh, for some flights um, that we're still evaluating. So uh, um, the the second question, the answer is is absolutely yes. Uh, as far as the specific numbers, I, I really I, I want to uh, I, I don't have the data here, and rather than Go, go from my memory. I'd rather uh, I'd rather I'll take a note here, and we'll uh, we'll get that answer to you here just a few minutes after we're done. Uh, it's 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 public record. We'll be happy to provide that. I just rather than quote it off my uh, off my brain, I'd rather uh, rather get you the exact number. All right. We had a couple drop off the phone bridge. So again, if you do still have a question, you haven't asked one yet, please press star one to make sure that you are in our queue. Uh, all right, next up, let's go to Khaled Henry with VIA Satellite. You're up. Hi, uh, my question is uh, about CubeSat launches mainly from the International Space Station. That's been something that's grown in popularity recently. Uh, does the new contract take into consideration at all uh, requirements for satellite launches from the ISS? Yeah, the new, the new contract is, is silent on that, but today under the CRS-1, as you know, we are flying, we're flying up uh, deployers and launching uh, not only CubeSats, by the way, we're launching other, other deployers. Uh, in fact, we just launched uh, another deployer on the last uh, orbital flight here that's currently berthed to ISS called Kaber. Uh, so yes, I, I expect uh, that ISS will continue to, uh, to deploy uh, CubeSats and other small satellites. Um, they'll be both for NASA research, but, but uh, to a large extent, they'll be for, for commercial entities through, the, through our national lab and, and cases. Um, and uh, I expect that to continue and to, uh, 
and to grow, but it really it wasn't directly addressed in this contract. It's one of our goals, as I mentioned earlier, to foster a low Earth orbit economy, and as we all know, CubeSats are a, a growing portion of that low Earth orbit uh, economy. All right, we're going to bring it back here inside the room real quick. We do have some time for follow-ups. I think, Robert, you had one real quick. Uh, Robert Perlin with CollectSpace.com again. Um, it was mentioned that um, under CRS2 you, uh, you have in increased mass on all three vehicles. Uh, Dream Chaser is new. Uh, can you clarify the, the Cygnus? Is the same expanded Cygnus that just launched on Atlas that's on station now? And what does that mean for Dragon? Is there a is there a new Dragon or a, a new cargo Dragon that offers more mass, or is it just taking advantage of more capability? Uh, so. Uh, there was a minimum, um, I mentioned it, 2.5 to uh, 5 metric tons of, uh, of cargo that they had to meet in order to go to, uh, in order to compete for CRS2. And all of them met that. So, um, and I would tell you the missions are different. Um, for instance, Orbital ATK, their capability to lift from, uh, from Florida on an Atlas is different than their ability to lift from a, um, uh, uh, Antares from from Wallops, and so there really isn't a there really isn't a crisp uh, answer to your uh, answer to your question. The requirement the Dragon that's going to go they offered a mission that docks to ISS. So is it different? Yes, I expect it to be different. But there, uh, you know, the, that's the, the the exact details of the differences is is probably something that uh, those companies ought to talk about. Okay, and we do have a couple more that hop back on the phone bridge. Let's do Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Marsha. Hello, um, for Kirk. Um, did I understand correctly in you saying that Sierra Nevada would have the option of launching either from Cape Canaveral or Wallops um, on the two different rockets? And does that mean that it will be just as flexible in where it can land uh, on a runway? So the, the Dream Chaser, the Sierra Nevada proposal, uh, launched only from Florida. So they did not offer to fly from, uh, from anywhere else and, and anything other than a, a specific Atlas rocket. Um, that was their, their proposal. Uh, I have heard uh, Mark Serangelo uh, talk about the capability of uh, Dream Chaser to land in lots of places. Um, uh, you can you can probably ask him about where it might be able to land, but I'm told it's quite uh, quite capable to land in lots of places. For us, um, Julie likes her samples really quick, as you heard, and uh, mm -hmm. and you know uh, we don't have we don't have at at, at the uh, Dulles Airport we don't have that many uh, labs, so most likely it's going to land. And by the way, the air traffic controllers would hate us landing uh, landing there. So. <laughs> um, but what we most likely will land in Florida, right close to where, where our facilities are. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, so uh, let me not comment too much on the capabilities of, the, of that, that vehicle, other than to say our, that rocket's going to launch from Florida, and we're going to land it close to our, uh, close to our facilities to, uh, to support our, our research uh, recovery on board uh, uh, from that vehicle. All right, next up we have Ken Chang with the New York Times. Ken. Hi, thank you. Um, Kirk mission four flights a year, so from 2019 to 2024 is five years, and that's 20 flights in total. Is progress on, in addition to that, or is progress being phased out? Uh, so I said approximately four flights. That's the beauty of this. Again, the vehicles have, have different up mass capabilities and different down mass capabilities. And so, uh, number one. Number two is, by the way, if you, the reason I said approximately, if, if anyone draws a 12-month period, uh, you, you know, depending on where the flights fall, it might be more or less than uh, than that. That's why I said approximately. I didn't I didn't want anyone to go beat me over the head about hey, it's five flights and you said four, but uh, or three and you said five. And so, um, uh, in general, we expect uh, uh, we in, in general we expect four flights. The Progress vehicle is the Russian vehicle, so we ex the Russians have responsibility to launch their cargo. And, uh, and so uh, at this point in time, the Russians continue to build and launch progress, as they've told us that that's their intent. So I don't, uh, I don't see uh, the, anything happening with their progress. And, and this procurement really has no impact on, on the Russian ability to, uh, to launch cargo to ISS. All right, now we have Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Frank? Thank you again. Um, Kirk, I believe Sierra Nevada had a separate 
cargo module, kind of like a trailer behind the uh, lifting body shape. How does are, is that part of this uh, this contract, and how would you use that new capability or, or planned capability? Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, let me defer to, to Sierra Nevada about the specifics of their vehicle. I can tell you that they have the ability to, to carry the, the required amount of unpressurized cargo. And so uh, the pressurized cargo will go inside the, you know, the, the pressure part of the pressurized part, and, and we'll, we have the ability to meet our unpressurized needs um, through their vehicle design, so uh, you know that, that, that's that's probably that's probably the uh, most I could say at this point in time. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's a very it's a very capable vehicle, uh, and we're really looking forward to having that in our suite of uh, capabilities to carry cargo to the ISS. All right, I'm going to bring it back into the room real quick for follow-ups. Thank you, Eric. Did you still have one? Yeah. Um, so you talked about the, uh, Eric Berger with Ars Technica, you talked about the landing capabilities of, of Dream Chaser and you were going to probably put that back in Florida. The SpaceX and the, um, uh, the Dragon, will that land somewhere given the expected location for that? And then how long, I think the three to six hours return time you mentioned in terms of getting samples was Dream Chaser, how long until you can get stuff off of the Dragon? Uh, the Dragon right now, the proposal was uh, landing plus six hours for uh, early capability, which is not all of their cargo, but, but early. Um, and uh, um, so we'll look forward to that, that capability. They have, a, they have a, in their proposal, they had a land landing and a, uh, and a water landing. And again, it depends on the type of mission that we, uh, that we choose to buy. But in either case, we'll have the ability to have a, a six hour. I think the land landing, we actually have a three hour uh, recovery capability um, uh, as well. So uh, again, I, I have to tell you, I'm really excited about the suite of capabilities that we have, and 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 our ability to go select these different types of, uh, types of missions. Um, it's really going to allow us to uh, to greatly increase the uh, the our our flexibility and our utilization of of ISS. Gina. You're recruiting a new class of astronauts. What does uh, this what kind of message does this send to them about what they'll be able to do when they come to NASA? Well, as we've talked about in, in this recruitment, there's a variety of vehicles these new astronauts may fly on. We, we certainly want them to fly on the International Space Station. And of course, we have a, a couple of US vehicles in development to do that, as well as uh, continuing with the Soyuz. And we have Orion in development. And, and this resupply is saying, hey, we have the capability, we've made all the plans to make sure that we can have a total of seven crew members, um, four um, that would fly up on a U.S. capability when commercial crew is done. And so it, it's all part of the picture of being able to support ISS in the future. We'll take a few more follow-ups from the phone. Let's do James Dean from Florida today. James. Hi, thanks again. Um, Mr. Sharman, would it be correct to say that these awards complete the fleet of fleets of vehicles that will ever visit the ISS, uh, at least as uh, currently anticipated with operations to 2024. Is there, or there are there any any others, uh, domestic or international, that you know could come into the picture? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I, domestically, I can I can answer right now. We have no other vehicles. We have the the commercial crew vehicles. We have these cargo vehicles, the cargo vehicles under CRS-1. Um, we have HTV, which, uh, will, which will continue. It's also important ability for, uh, for carrying cargo to the ISS, and they will continue, which is uh, provided by the Japanese uh, uh, Aerospace Exploration uh, Agency. So uh, that, is, that is our extent of what's planned at this point in time. I really hate to use the word complete, because um, who knows what the future will hold, but that is our, that is the, that is the only thing we have planned at this point in time. As for internationals, the, the Russians uh, have talked about a number of vehicles that they, uh, they have plans to go, uh, to go build, and uh, uh, no, number one. Number two is, you know, the Russian philosophy has been evolution. So uh, the progress that was just launched here uh, at the end of last year was a new progress. And so uh, I, I really don't want to speak for the Russians. Uh, there is a possibility there might be other vehicles uh, from them, but you'd really have to talk to uh, Roscosmos about uh, the specifics of their plans. Okay, now Irene Klotz with Reuters. Irene? Thanks. Um, 
Kirk, can you say anything about uh, now why Boeing was dropped back in November? They were quite public about the um, decision. And um, any reason specifically for the delay in the first flights under the new contracts from 2018 to 2019? Thank you. Yeah, relative to Boeing, I'm not sure what I can say at this point in time, so uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather defer that. Uh, at the right time, we'll be able to discuss that further, but we have to have briefings with, with all the offers, and, and, uh, and so uh, if, if I can, I'd like to defer uh, answering that question, but, but promise to answer it in the future. Um, let's see. And the, uh, Can you remind me uh, the second part of your question? About the uh, change of the target launch under the first CRS2 contracts from 2018 oh, to 2019. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, the delay. So why? Well, we delayed this procurement a number of times. One, it was it was very complicated. We had we had uh, an, uh, multiple offers, as you uh, as you know, and it took us a while to go. Uh, and 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 we so we've been talking about the different mission types of the uh, of the vehicles, and it, it just turned out to be a really complicated um, process. Uh, so. The result of us wanting to take the appropriate amount of time to look at, uh, at, at all the details and, and make the right choice for, for NASA, for the United States, um, that caused us to delay. And if you look at each contract, each offer uh, says, hey, I need so much time to integrate, to, 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 to do my ISS integration, and so much time to build my vehicles before I'm ready to fly. When you put all that together, it really puts them in, in the latter half of 2019. So. The, the real reason for the delay was us being very deliberate and very careful, make sure we made the right decision, um, which you heard today, and uh, and that's caused us to to delay a little bit when these uh, these first flights will fly. Okay, we have time for just two more from the phone. Let's first go to Gotham once again with Cowan and Company. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how dynamic pricing will be. Uh, for example, if you were to order the same mission from one of the contractors multiple times, would you anticipate that the price would, would step down over time? And, and as you issue task orders, are you going to compete them among the contractors and award them based on kind of best price? Uh, so uh, the price of the various, the, the price of the various offers is, is really, um, uh, you know, at this point in time, we're not ready to release that. I don't know that we'll ever be, you know, some of that's competition sensitive. So, um, uh, so uh, I, it's hard to directly answer your question. Plus the fact that each, each mission type and each provider is different. There is no, there is not really going to be an apples to apples um, comparison. Uh, as, we, as we go forward and issue task orders to buy flights, first of all, we have a minimum requirement for each of the providers so you can, you can, guarantee, we can guarantee that we will buy six from each one of those providers. Beyond that, uh, again, and, and even within that, between now and 2024, as we're going, we're going to decide which type of mission do we need at any given time. So price will be a factor, but it's only one of many, many factors. Um, and, and so uh, I, I don't see it as, it's not like going out and, 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 and buying gas from a gas station. You just find the cheapest one and go buy it. You, it's much more complicated than that. So. Um, but price is absolutely a consideration. But really, uh, you know, like I said, it's one, it's one of, uh, of six or seven different factors uh, and not, not, uh, not the driving requirement. All right. And lastly, we will go to Ken Chang with the New York Times again. Ken? Hi, thanks. I was wondering if you could give us a minimum value of these contracts by multiplying six by the cheapest option. <laughs> I could, yes, I could, uh, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> so uh, again, uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, your uh, your ears and, and others' eagerness to know exactly the price of each of these options, and that's just not information we can we can divulge at this time. Uh, I, I think the the competition was very competitive, the, and as you'll you'll see, the source, uh, you know, the criteria for making the source selection, price was a very important. Uh, in terms of, of selecting these three companies and their offerings, um, but they're so they're so diverse and in the, in the capabilities, uh, you know. It, uh, the only thing I'll tell you right now is way under, uh, significantly under the maximum contract value that I mentioned earlier. Um, but but uh, I, I can't give you the absolute minimum price. Um, you know, t that even implies that 
that it meets all our requirements, and, and the minimum price would not meet all of our requirements. So there's, unfortunately, it's just, number one, I, I won't tell you the prices today, and number two, it's, it really isn't that, that, uh, that cut and dry. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and thanks again to all of our briefers here uh, for this historic announcement. Um, again, the source selection rationale and additional details will be released in the future at the appropriate time. Any follow-up questions about this announcement can, of course, be directed to NASA's Office of Communications. And you can read more about this announcement and the continuing journey of human spaceflight and NASA's mission to the International Space Station and beyond online at nasa.gov. Thank you for joining us, and that'll do it.